my part of this like, is is deceptively simple, as I have said this a couple times to other people who've talked to me about this. Our facilities people had been working with a very large German energy type company that I'm not going to give the name of, and we had a thirteen and a half million dollar proposal that came to them to say we will put this in for free. So they came running to me saying, I can get $13.5 million worth of stuff we desperately need, and it's free. All we have to do is turn over 15 years worth of energy savings. So the facilities people are saying, it's free. Oh, we're, we're going we're gonna to save money, and we're going to have this then for X number more years after that. So we've got $13.5 million of stuff for free. Uh, I met with that large energy company three different times and asked them why 15 years. They explained why it had to be 15 years. I said, what were your assumptions as far as interest rates and you know all that kind of stuff? Because this company would be doing the installation and the financing. So as a financial guy, of course, you know, I want to know all the makeup of the costs. And it just seemed a little sketchy to me, for lack of a better term. So I did something rarely done by a CFO. And what I did was I broke the, well, breaking it apart into two pieces wasn't rare. But so I said, we're going to do two things. We're going to look at the installation piece and we're going to look at the financing piece separately. We looked around and of course you've heard my story about meeting with Andre uh, two years ago and they, they, they came in at the very end of the process after we had been talking to this large company for many years and before that a, uh, a, an, another energy company in the U.S. that starts with a T. Um, so then I went to the, the banks and said, I'm going to tell you that what we're going to do. We're going to borrow $13.5 million. And I'm going to tell you how much I want to pay per year in payments. That's the piece that normally isn't done. And you are going to tell me how many years I'm going to make those payments. So the banks were given the opposite equation of what they usually get. They were told what I'm going to borrow, and I told them what I wanted to pay back and what their, their equation had to then solve for how many years would I have to make the payments. So what I'm going to show you is what we have here is the model that we put together with our friends at First American Educational Finance. They came in and beat all the banks in what they were trying to uh, to, to do on the financing side. so But the first American people then came back and said, all right, so you're borrowing $13.5 million. I know from my contract with Andre, as he said, I have a guarantee as far as how much energy savings I'm going to have. So I knocked it down a little bit and said, first American, if I pay you a million two in the first year, and each of those, and then each year those payments go up 3%, now that 3% is probably consistent with also what the energy savings are going to go up because the rates are probably going to go up about the same amount anyway. So the first deal that I turned down, it was 100% of the energy savings for 15 years. So then when I take the numbers and give it to First American, you're going to see these are the payments that we make. And you're going to see at this point it's 12 years. But the final payment here is a little, you can see it hasn't gone up 2%. So 143 months worth of payments. The, the, the deal I didn't like was how many months? 180, right? Okay, but that's not the end. So I'm making 143 months worth of payments here. At the same time, the way we did it, and you heard earlier about NYSERDA, there were rebates. Well, this other company that was going to do the deal for us was going to keep the rebates. Under the way we structured it here, we get the rebates. The rebates on this deal were close to 20% of the cost, which not another 24 months off of this number. So I'm at 143 months minus 24 months. So now down to 119 months compared to the original 180 months. 
then when you do the math, because I'm only paying about 97 or 95 percent of what I'm getting in the energy savings, and I'm pocketing the other five or so percent, that was worth like another 16 or 17 months. So I'm down to something like I'm paying for 102 months. I'm using 102 months worth of energy savings to pay for this 13 and a half million instead of 180 months. So we saved something like 80 months or 78 months. It was a difference of nine million dollars that we're not paying over. So that's why I say it's a deceptively simple thing. Sometimes facilities people get these proposals, and it was great that our guys were getting all this, but every once in a while, then you want someone to you know, step back. It's maybe not a free lunch, or it could be a free lunch at a much lower amount of payments of the energy savings. So the plant is going to then run if I'm breaking even now after 106 months or whatever it is, it's going to run for 20 more years. So obviously, the to even using this model, we're coming up with a $27 million excess. And that doesn't factor in the fact that I got the rebates on top of this and uh, the other energy savings. So this, from my point of view, with this campus, 70 acres, 2 million square feet of space, and 30 buildings, I know, as Andre said in the beginning, this doesn't work for everybody. For us, it was a home run. We also hit this at the right time with a nice CERTA uh, rebates, not all of which, again, as you heard earlier, are going to be continuing. So anyway, that's my piece. I, I can't, you know, I can't jazz it up. I can't do anything to make it sexier than it is. It's just very simple. I think that's a whole lot of sexy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Catherine, if I, if I could just get one thing. Uh, I'm Bob Shipley. I'm the facilities guy that had to convince him to do this. Uh, and quite honestly, I did exactly what he said. I went to him all excited. I've got this great project. This large German company is going to pay to do this. It's not going to cost us a penny. I had old boilers I had to replace, and we had to do something about it. And exactly, you know, we went through this process together. So I think it was important to note that we worked with the financial people, not just saying, well, look, here it is, this is what we have to do, and trying to push them to see it our way. He found a creative solution to get us the financing we needed in order to make the project work. And ultimately, my goal was to get the project. So we came to a good conclusion. And if any of you come to see it later, you'll, you'll see it's a pretty spectacular bit, piece of work. Great, thank you. I should also say I believe Adelphi is the only uh, the only customer who got nice sort of funding uh, on Long Island. Uh, we went in under the the, the pond. I think it was twenty seven oh one, which is now exhausted. It doesn't have any more money, but we got a uh, little over two point five million uh, there. So, thank you, nice sort of. Uh, okay, so next up is Richard Cohen. I am Rich Cohen. I'm from NYU Lango Medical Center. I'm going to be talking about uh, resiliency, our co-generation facility, and also some pretty significant infrastructure improvements that we've made. I'm going to start first by describing the medical center campus. Uh, NYU Medical Center has um, many different areas throughout the city on Long Island and Westchester. The main medical center campus is on 34th Street and 1st Avenue. It's uh, from 30th to 34th Street, 1st Avenue to the river. About a three and a half million square foot campus. It's on about seven acres of land. Um, energy bills were, well, we had about 15 megawatts of uh, demand for electricity and our uh, <coughs> steam consumption was 120, about 120,000 pounds an hour peak. Uh, we, we were completely dependent on Con Edison for both steam and for electricity, and um, that forms the backdrop of this discussion this morning. On October 27, 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit. Hurricane Sandy hit, we were faced with a wall of water about 10 feet high. It inundated the basements of the medical center. That was about between 175 and 180,000 square foot of basement and it also went up a foot and a half on the ground floor of the facility. As most people know, when you build uh, campuses and when you build buildings, 
where do you put most of your utilities? You put them in the basement. And what happened was all five of our electrical services were flooded. Our main steam supply line from Con Edison went underwater. Um, our water services were compromised. And as a result, um, the medical center on that day was essentially dead. Our emergency generators did operate. Unfortunately, in the city of New York, you need to put your fuel supply in what location? In the basement. We flooded all of our fuel supplies, and what happened was after a certain period of time, our day tanks were depleted, and we lost emergency power. At that point, we had to evacuate the entire medical center. I don't know if people have seen this on, uh, on television. We had something like 75 ambulances. We had to carry down patients, um, uh, down flights of stairs using flashlights, et cetera, et cetera. So it was not a good day. <clears throat> I spent and my team spent the next six weeks straight rebuilding the facility. Um, on uh, December 24th, um, on Christmas Eve, we reopened the facility. Um, this was in large part due to efforts by a, a tremendous amount of electrical contractors, steam fitters, etc. So what do we do to avoid this? And that's really the question um, that was asked um, um, by me and what I'm going to present today to you. So what we want to do is re re reduce our vulnerabilities to the utility or from the utility, reduce our vulnerabilities from natural disasters. One of the things that we decided was we had to move up all of our utilities from the cellar levels up two flights to the first floor. So the medical center is built on a slope. There's a cellar level, a ground floor, and then the first floor, which is equivalent to um, First Avenue in Manhattan. We had already planned to build a cogeneration facility. The cogeneration facility that we had designed was an eight megawatt um, gas turbine connected to 150,000 pound an hour um, Herzig uh, heat recovery steam generator, going to a three megawatt steam turbine generator, um, and then that reduced the pressure from 600 psi to 200 psi, and we sent 200 psi steam out to the campus. One of the things that um, we realized early on that was in between the time of the design of the cogeneration facility, which was 2010, plus or minus, up until the time in which we were recovering from uh, Hurricane Sandy, we had implemented a, a fairly substantial um, energy optimization program. So most people here are probably familiar with energy reduction. Everybody wants to reduce their energy in the facility. That's something that we do not do at NYU. What we do is we try to optimize our environment. So by optimizing our environments, we will save energy. So our first goal is not to save money, it's not to save kilowatt hours, it's not to save steam. Our first goal is to make sure that our mission in the medical center can be handled, can be handled in the best and most efficient way. So what do we do? We do patient care, we train the next generation of scientists, and we also do research and science to figure out what are the next um, um, uh, medical, medical breakthroughs so we can reduce human suffering. So we want to optimize our environments. And when we find when we optimize the environments, that is, we um, provide the environmental conditions such that everything is done according to how the uh, design engineers design things, and by code and by providing the necessary code requirements, we find we reduce our energy substantially. So as an example, we had 120,000 pound an hour um, steam demand. Last winter on the coldest day of the year, our steam demand was 66,000 pounds. So we reduced, it, we reduced our steam um, almost 50%. So how does that relate to cogeneration? How does that um, um, relate to resiliency? So one of the things we found out, and this is a lesson learned, is that you really have to pay attention to what your steam load is. We'll talk a little bit about electrical load, but what your steam load is because we have a steam following plant. That means we need a place to put the steam in order to maximize the amount of electricity coming out of the cogeneration facility. So the minimum steam fire on a solar uh, Taurus 70 uh, gas, gas turbine is about 32, 33,000 pounds an hour. So we have to be able to um, consume that amount of steam. So if we're not running our steam chillers, which are about 60,000 pounds an hour total, and let's say we're in a, a shoulder season, we, we have to find a place um, for the steam. 
So as a result, we have to figure out what are our dispatch strategies and what are our environmental strategies so we can not only optimize the environment, but also run the cogen in the most efficient way. The other issue that we have is day one, when we put in the cogeneration facility, um, we were going to generate an excess amount of electricity. So as I said, we had five electrical services coming in. We um, dismantled one service. When we put in the cogeneration facility, we added a service. We still have five. Um, but we needed a place to put the power. So our cogener I'll give you an example. Yesterday, our cogeneration facility was operating. We had a load of, and it's connected only to the major hospital building now, and I'll talk about how we're going to microgrid this uh, to other buildings and also to the utility in a couple of minutes. Um, but our load was about um, three megawatts of power. We were generating close to seven megawatts through um, the cogeneration facility. We were selling to Con Edison, our utility, four megawatts of power. One of the issues there is um, how much is the utility going to pay you for your excess energy? And Con Edison, um, they're an investor-owned utility, just like PSE and G Long Island. They like to make money. They're, they want to give you the least amount of money possible, and they will pay you what the um, essentially what the energy, the marginal energy cost is, uh, cost to you is, uh, which is a lot less than the actual cost of delivered energy. Um, in New York. Uh, the, P the Public Service Commission did allow something called an offset tariff. And what that means is we essentially generate power into the grid and we sell energy back to ourselves. So we have one electrical service that we're pumping energy out on. We have four other services that we're getting offset tariffs. So that offset tariff works kilowatt hour per kilowatt hour, kilowatt per kilowatt. Um, so that works. The only thing is you have to apply for it. And Applying for it is not necessarily a slam dunk. You really have to provide a lot of justification. The, the other thing we did with resiliency was we have a cogeneration facility. It's eight megawatts for the gas for the gas turbine, three megawatts for the steam turbine. Um, we're also embarking on a rather large building program. So we're building about a million and a half new square new square feet of hospital and also research facilities. Um, at the end of 2017, we'll have in place um, close to 4.2, 4.3 million square feet. At that period of time, we will then be a, a net importer of energy from, from Con Edison. Um, but with the theme of resilience, um, we put in a gas engine into our new hospital building. So it's a Yenbacher 3 megawatt gas engine. Um, it's also a cogeneration facility as well. It's three megawatts of power, plus we use it to generate hot water to put it to the reheat um, um, and perimeter heating systems throughout the, uh, throughout the building. Um, that also goes back to the main uh, cogeneration facility into what we call the collector bus. Um, at times, we will be a net exporter, like uh, shoulder seasons uh, um, at night uh, with the utility. One of the challenges was um, the price of gas. So again, I, I'm familiar with the New York City market. Um, in the New York City market, you can buy firm gas, you can buy non-firm gas, you can buy cogeneration gas. Um, we filed a case with the Public Service Commission to force the utility to sell us offset, uh, not offset, um, cogeneration gas to our gas engine in the new building. Um, it took about a year and a half. We had to hire a specialty law firm to plead on our behalf. We won the case, um, and so now for institutions that have campuses, um, you can put multiple cogeneration facilities in, and the cogeneration gas rate, which is a very lucrative rate, um, will, uh, will apply. It's also a firm gas rate um, as well. Um, so what do we have? So we have a cogeneration facility. Um, we have a gas engine facility. And the final piece of this is where do you put all of this power? So um, one of the incentives of going with cogeneration is that it enables you to rebuild your electrical infrastructure. We had a very aging electrical infrastructure. Um, it varied from the 1950s to um, about the 1990s, plus or minus. Um, 
what we are doing in five separate services. We're connecting the cogeneration to all five of these services. Um, we finish one, and one will be finished about once every six months um, over the next two years. All the new electrical services are what are called double-ended substations. Double-ended substation means that you have two independent electrical feeders feeding your substation in case one fails, you'll have 100% redundancy. We are a hospital. We're also a, a scientific institute. What happens if we lose Con Edison? What happens if we lose the cogeneration? What happens if we lose our gas engine? We have to rely on emergency generators. So not only do we have, um, the one thing I didn't talk about was the new electric service going in. It's a 30 megawatt primary electric service, 13,200 volts. It's on the equivalent of the seventh floor of a building that gets distributed throughout the campus. Um, what happens if we lose that and we lose everything else? We have 24 megawatts of emergency generator capability um, on the campus. That doesn't mean all 24 megawatts are utilized. It's about 12 megawatts which are actually connected. The challenge in emergency power generators and cogeneration is how do you use both of them at the same time? So if you're familiar with the way emergency generators work and automatic transfer switches work, as soon as you have a blackout, the transfer switch sends a signal to a generator, the generator starts. As soon as power is available on the emergency side of the transfer switch, it transfers. When you have cogeneration and you're operating on, on cogeneration, your normal power is restored, so the transfer switch thinks everything is normal. It's going to transfer back and away from your generator. So if you want to maximize your power going out to your facility, you have to figure out a strategy in which you can run your emergency generators and your cogeneration at the same time, such that um, one doesn't obviate the other. Um, that's, it sounds pretty simple to do. Um, it's something that we're working on um, traditionally. Uh, one of the issues that we've been concerned with is if you um, disable the transfer switch um, so it doesn't transfer back upon recognizing normal power and you lose your cogen, you've lost everything. So that's a challenge that we're facing now, and um, we have a strategy in place by which we manually will be able to transfer um, energy back. We currently haven't had that figured out, and that's one of the big challenges for us. So futuristically, what we're looking at is a completely resilient facility. Um, all of the major utilities are located at least 20 feet above what's expected to be the 500-year flood line, um, where we'll be self-sufficient. I haven't talked about cost. It was very expensive to do this. Um, it's an excess. It was in excess of $100 million. We save, uh, we're probably going to save about $12 million to $13 million a year on our energy costs, um, which is a fairly decent payback. Um, if, we take, if we took just a look at the cogen, though, the cogen uh, was probably about half of that. So the payback for the cogen itself um, was substantially less. So it's an opportunity um, not only to save power, save energy, save money. It's an opportunity to renew your infrastructure throughout your facility in a way in which it kind of almost pays for itself. We self-financed this. We did not go out for any financing. Um, our CFO has a generally an energy positive attitude. If uh, we bring the CFO um, pretty much any project with a three to five year payback, it's instantly financed or he'll, he will provide the money. For the cogeneration, um, we had to make a few presentations. CFO was uh, completely on board and um, significantly invested um, in this project. Um, just one final word. Um, if you think cogen is something you buy off the shelf and you plug it in and then you go home, um, it's the farthest thing from the truth. You need, at least in very large installations like ours, you need a highly skilled, highly technical staff that not only can supervise the construction of it, but then commission it and then operate it. One example, um, yesterday at 10.51, we had a massive power hit from Con Edison. So our voltage was reduced by 60% for a short period of time. What happened was the differential breakers, for differential sensors for the breakers and cogen recognized this and they all opened up. Right? And, and that's exactly what they're supposed to do. It's designed to protect the cogeneration facility uh, from your utility so you're not pumping um, into an infinite um, you know, sink of, of need for the utility. Um, 
Fortunately, we have very skilled staff on hand, so they will restore everything within a matter of seconds, um, and there was no interruptions in the facility. Without it being a staff facility, without it having staff and skilled people there, um, it, it really could have been a lot worse. So all I would say to everybody is I would caution you that these are very, very sophisticated um, electrical and mechanical devices, um, and uh, you really do need a high skill set. And after this, I'm willing to take any questions. Thanks. Okay, we're going to hold questions to the end. I'd like to get Bill on on decentralization. Hi, folks. I guess I'm the bad guy today. Um, <laughs> My name is Bill Kirker. I'm the Director of Facilities at Long Island University at the Post Campus, uh, right up here on Northern Boulevard. Uh, we had a extremely high interest in trying to make CoGen work for us. Uh, I've been there for a little over 20 years, and we've looked at it several times, and just couldn't make it work for us uh, from a standpoint of our heat load. Uh, we shut down our boiler plant in the summertime. We have uh, independent domestic water boilers in all our buildings, so we have no reason to run our, our, our plant in the, uh, in the summertime. Uh, so even adding an absorption chiller for our central chiller plant, uh, we still had shoulder months where probably close to three months, we still had no heat load. Um, so we just couldn't just couldn't make it work uh, financially uh, based on that. Uh, and we also started uh, creeping up in age with our underground piping system. We have a little over three and a half miles of underground high temp hot water piping. Uh, it uh, is approaching 50 years old. Uh, we spend a couple hundred thousand dollars a year just making some repairs on it. Uh, usually at uh, poor times of the year, uh, usually when it's cold and we need to provide heat. Um, it was going to cost us somewhat of about $30 million plus to replace our underground piping system. Uh, so we started looking at uh, actually decentralizing, uh, which then even puts us in a further position away from co-generation. Uh, and we're actually in the process of doing that now. We are decentralizing our, our plant. Uh, we've got uh, 30 buildings that are on the uh, high temp hot water system. We currently have three off the plant now and we're taking seven more off this summer. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, the way our system is segregated, it's got three loops, and uh, we'll have one of our loops uh, fully off, uh, hopefully by the, <coughs> by the by this winter time. Um, resiliency was one thing that we wanted to work on CoGen, uh, as living on the North Shore with overhead power lines and a lot of trees, uh, we have power outages on a more than desired uh, time frame. It's gotten much better over the years, but when I first started, we would have power outage probably um, once a month. We'd have something. Uh, we'd have dips on uh, a weekly basis. Uh, we now will see a power outage of some sort probably about two, three times a year. Uh, most recently, we just had one last Tuesday. Uh, which was a little bit of a different scenario, uh, caused by a car hitting a pole, a 13-2 line that feeds our campus and sent a, a very good surge onto our campus. Uh, we're still trying to recover from burned out uh, uh, boards for everything from vending laundry machines up to HVAC controls, uh, VFDs, uh, we're, we're fire alarm systems, everything uh, in some fashion took a hit. Um, so we, we wanted CoGen to work in the, in the uh, worst way, um, but just couldn't, couldn't make it happen. So uh, with the technology now 
though we are looking at uh, condensing boilers in all our buildings. They take much less footprint. Uh, flues are much easier to work with. Um, we are keeping our domestic hot water separate. Uh, we're putting independent condensing uh, tankless water heaters for all of our condensing, uh, for all of our domestic water needs in all our buildings. Um, we're looking at uh, also seeing an energy savings. Obviously, the consumption uh, of condensing boilers is less, they're more efficient. Uh, we're probably looking at about 10% uh, of our energy uh, on our fossil fuel side, which is going to equate uh, to about $100,000 a year just from that aspect of it. Uh, and we're also building in redundancy to all our buildings. One of the problems we had with our leaks is one leak caused 10 buildings to be without heat for anywhere from one to three, four days. Uh, and that's a problem if it's in the middle of winter and you get dormitories. Um, so uh, we're, our redundancy that we're building in, uh, if our load is uh, 1.5 million BTUs, we're, we're putting in three 750 uh, BTU boilers. So we are, we've got uh, enough with just two of them to carry the full load of the building, and we've got a third that will act as 50% uh, redundancy. Uh, but we will operate them at uh, all in uh, simultaneously, so uh, to keep our uh, efficiencies up to keep the boilers in condensing mode. So um, our estimated cost on taking care of the campus and decentralizing is going to be about 10 to 12, uh, 10 to 12 million dollars over the next four years, as opposed to, like I said, about 30 million to just replace our underground piping system. So. I think another thing I'd like to say about, um, about LIE Post is that Bill's been able to achieve uh, fabulous, not German level, fabulous uh, energy intensity. Reductions. He's down to, I think it's between 80 and 85 kBTU per square foot. A uh, little, little over 85, but 88. 88. 88 is the. Uh, and he knows the number. Yeah. Numbers we've got, yes. Yeah. Um, um, so, and we, we do it by not just turning heat off and turning lights off. Uh, we do it by any time renovations are happening. We're putting in higher efficiency equipment putting in VFD drives wherever we can, uh, more energy controls and everything. Um, it's uh, a matter of being able to control our energy costs, not just trying to uh, turn things off on people. Um, we're not uh, a medical center where we have uh, life or death situations, but we are an academic environment where we have um, Faculty who appear to have life and death situations. <laughs> so so we, uh, we we do take that into consideration and, and try and try and give them the service and uh, the environment that they they, they deserve. So, I think, uh, somebody reminded me this morning before we started that well everybody in the room is uh, engineering and facilities oriented. That at the end of the day, uh, the people you are all uh, entrusted to keep safe and happy and warm uh, are students and patients. And so uh, to, to Richard's earlier point, uh, the facilities mission to a certain extent has to follow the, um, the medical or the, um, the educational missions. And I think uh, Bill's solution has sort of married that very nicely. Uh, okay. All right. Hi. I think that's it, unless there's any questions on it. I'd like to talk to anybody after either. I'm going to have a question follow up, but if you could pass to Tom. All right. Tom's going to tell us about St. John's, and I think he's got some visuals as well. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. There's probably a tremendous amount of uh, intelligence and experience uh, in this room and on this panel. Of course, I, I'm amazed. Uh, 85. Uh, KB2 per square foot is so, so impressive. So I'm going to go back to what Andre said uh, when he opened up about 
where is our benchmark? What are we trying to accomplish first and foremost? And what Catherine just said is it's service, right? So it's service to the students and student experience on the campus. It, 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 everything we do has to drive that. And some of that is a complicated puzzle, whether or not it is reducing the energy cost to use our resources best to handle the student experience on campus, whether it's reducing our energy costs in order to renew our uh, aging infrastructure so that doors can stay open for business. It's providing energy, energy conservation so that we can green the initiatives and have our students become part of that experience uh, to be good citizens of, uh, of the universe, right? So for St. John's, if it's okay, we'll pull up the, uh, the CHP discussion item on my PowerPoint. And I'll just give you a little flavor of three years worth of in-depth uh, experience for me in trying to figure out whether this was the, a good decision that would increase all of what I just said about the student experience, capital renewal, keep the doors open for business, keep the costs down. A long time ago, we were going to put a two megawatt plant in. And then when Hurricane Sandy hit and we increased our, uh, we needed to bring together some of the uh, load to a reliable double contingency substation um, with three feeders, we needed to add a fourth and put more reliability to get rid of the overhead power lines on campus. So when Hurricane Sandy hit, we invested $6 million in order to increase the infrastructure of the electrical duct bank and put seven more buildings on the double contingency substations that now has four feeders, four or five megawatt feeders feeding that. That's about two thirds of the campus. So our peak demand on that substation um, sort of the upper uh, left-hand corner where the white box is. That's about a 6.5 megawatt uh, peak demand. And if you have ever looked at energy profiles for university, the resident halls all peak at around 9.30 night when people are putting their pajamas on and running around. And then, uh, you know, it's catch up in the morning on the HVAC if you've got a summer load on your hands. And then it's... Uh, it slows down in the evening. Hopefully, people are turning, turning things off properly on the building automation systems. However, Thanksgiving weekend comes. However, Christmas break or winter break comes. However, you know, spring break comes, summertime comes. Whether or not they're getting just uh, revenues for filling up the residence halls in the summer for conferences for discretionary funding. So the business part of this whole puzzle uh, comes very much into play. So what does it revolve around? Getting the right data. Data is everything. We could probably stay here a week with the kinds of general statements that were made here today about the decision process and what that might mean as far as borrowing the money at an interest rate, having debt on the books, whether or not it's performance contracting or, or PP agreement, PPA agreement, whether or not it's systems reliability. We could be here for a week. And I suggest that if you haven't really explored this, you need to go somewhere for a week. <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to be a full week of your uh, undivided attention to try to figure out this, this system. So we were heading down this road. Uh, just to give a, a quick background on, on Joanna Moore's uh, uh, relationship with St. John's, we originally started in 2009 with an investment grade audit for energy conservation on the entire campus. So we've got 2.2 million square feet on the map here, and we wanted to go to every bit of the campus to find out what energy measures were. So now let's just take that to data for a second. The real data that comes out of that is, did you figure out what's broken? Did you do energy analysis for the hourly analysis according to the weather? Do you understand your occupancy, which is the two biggest variables in whether or not you're gonna go uh, finance something, whether it's occupancy and weather that changes over time? You've got to get so much data into this information gathering. Then you got to look at the infrastructure. We happen to have this double contingency feeder systems. It didn't go down in 20 years. I researched that to find out, do we really need a black star? How much, how much of this campus really needs to know that the students are going to be safe in their dorms? And what's the risk on that? So we did the investment grade audit. We started down the road of performance contracting as an option. So the Board of Trustees then approved $30 million of, of, of loans to do energy conservation projects in 2010. So now I'm busy. 
I've got a lot of projects. We decide not to go performance contracting. We decide to go in-house with everything and hold on to the co-gen until we figure this out more in depth. What did we find out as we go down this road is that a lot of this money is helping to renew infrastructure that you pointed out about uh, the hospital. So you're gonna incorporate energy conservation and infrastructure renewal and service to the campus and reliability all into this big giant puzzle, data, 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 data. So now you get into a cogeneration study that we did, well, first for the two megawatt plant, then for the four megawatt plant, after we put seven buildings online with the substation, and the economic analysis of both of those systems. You really need to understand what Bill was talking about, about this thermal load. If you haven't done metering in a very deep in way about figuring out what the thermal loads are on the hourly basis in what building that's going to stay online or have a load that you can't reduce, and we call it a base load, if you haven't done that, you need to do that. So just to give you an example, the 3 megawatt Yenbacher or the 8 megawatt, Yen, uh, 4 megawatt Yenbacher, that MMB to you per hour, you've got to put that heat somewhere if it's going to make economic sense. Or you're going to reject that out to the atmosphere through a radiator, a great big radiator on the roof. So now you get into this, you get into this cogeneration study. So what are the other issues? Let's move down a slide. I don't have to tell you what cogen is. You know what cogen is. Move down a slide. That was the model for us. We were going to save $1.6 million a year after uh, we had paid for the maintenance and the fuel. And that was our model. Move down one more slide. Okay, what did we find out? Here's the game changer. We hired a company called Antares Group. We got them from NYSERDA, basically. They are a flex tech uh, consulting company who just does due diligence reports in in the state of New York, pretty much. And what, that's, what that means is that there's no other interest. They're not trying to design, they're not trying to build, they're trying to figure out whether or not cogeneration is right for you. So we had the cogen study done. We had the application into NYSERDA. NYSERDA is doing a due diligence review to figure out if they're gonna fund us, but I needed to go further in having somebody come in and look at the financials, the real financials, not somebody who had an interest in making money on this campus or saving energy as a, an administrator of the uh, university. What did we find out? We found out some of the study was incorrect. We found out that, look at the nine items here just for a second. These nine items have been talked about briefly today, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, eight items rather. We're just gonna go over them quick because they're gonna, they may surprise you. So the first one is about how to structure a, 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 the service agreement with the provider who's gonna keep the engine running for you. That is, a, that is a deal in itself that you, you're going to have to go down that road, figuring out how who's going to take the responsibility. Can you contract that out? Yes. How, how, what do they care if your cogen goes down at 50, at what, $53, 40, uh, $54 an hour? Does it pay for them to run out the door and get you started up when they've got other cogeneration plants that, are, that need maintenance? Probably not. 54 bucks an hour to them is nothing. That's, but those are the kinds of structural deals in a, in a maintenance agreement. Engine lube oil. That, code, that machine is going to burn a lot of oil. It burns oil every hour. Different than your car. A lot different than your car. Okay, additional staffing. In our case, we don't have um, the skill sets in-house to do this. So we would have to have a third-party company come in and operate the plant. Number four, balancing the system of your plant. So this whole idea of keeping it online and keeping it efficient, balance of plant is just has to be a, a sort of a continuous monitoring pro process for you. Now, the utility company tariff standby, it's called contract demand in Con Edison world. What is that really gonna cost you if you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to buy full KW from the utility company at some point, your machine's gonna go down in August, that's the way life is, and you're going to suck full demand from the utility, and you really have to know what your tariff says about that and what you're going to do to handle it. And who's going to be responsible when that does happen? A service company? Can you contract it out? It's the risk. You're going to suck full power, and you're going to pay the next year. They're thinking it's going to go down again on you. It's going to go down again on the utility company in July this time instead of August. These things about keeping this machine up and running are huge issues. Telecom, T1 line, okay, that's a transfer trip. So those things about what protects the cogeneration from not 
feeding into the grid into a ground fault somewhere on the system is huge. And if you don't understand a, an interconnect agreement with the utility company, you really need to understand what that interconnection is, okay? And, the, and that's a telecom fee and it's, they, they look at, you know, information about where you're producing power, how much power you're producing, how much is on the grid, whether or not there's a difference in the, uh, in the power. So that it will trip automatically and, and you're tripped out at that point. Now you're sucking full demand from the utility. So a very, very complicated thing there we have to be very uh, cautious of. Um, the utility company also wants 12% of the capital cost per year in, in the Con Edison world for the annual maintenance fees to keep kind of to keep saying you're a customer and you're a co-generation uh, entity in our on our grid. Uh, other maintenance costs are just out there. The plant needs whatever gas detection in the plant that you didn't have before or for safety purposes, whatever. So what happened here? And Terry's estimated the annual maintenance to be $1.1 million to 1.2, and the bottom line savings would be somewhere around $700,000 a year. So we had a model here that said 1.6, shown to board of trustees. Due diligence says not even half of that, really. At the end of the day, you gotta be very, very careful about how you model the energy savings. Okay. So if the project costs between eight and ten million dollars, we're talking a ten to fourteen year payback. That's not going to be true for everybody, especially for campus like this, because they put it in with their existing boiler plants and we didn't have that opportunity. Next slide. So so where where are we saying here? Joanna Moore said something like you really need to consider other energy efficient measures before you do cogeneration. I totally agree. Okay, KBTU per square foot in St. John's University is somewhere around uh, 160 uh, BT, uh, KBTU per square foot per year. Bills is at 85. I got a long way to go to get there. I do have athletics and laboratories that maybe they don't have. But the point of it is, is that the KBTU per square foot can come down and it should come down. And when you get to bringing it down, people get excited. They get excited about the energy savings, the greening the campus. You can actually get students involved in making data available to them so they can do good speeches and do nice papers on campus. Involvement of the students is critical here. Um, so just to give you the uh, next one. This, this is the most important sentence for me on the takeaway. I think we lost it. And that is the second line of Interrogues. What did he say? This is exactly what was said here today. Not doing the other energy conservation measures can result in unintentional, operational, and cost disincentives to reduce energy use at the site in order to maintain the CHP plant design condition. If you put the big dog in, you need to feed the dog. The dog needs load. That's what the dog needs. Now, you want to put it, uh, my example right here. You put the dog in, you gotta feed the dog with load in order to make it economically. So let's just do a LED, for example. Who would have thought that we would be putting in 52,000 light bulbs and fixtures on the St. John's campus two years ago? It wasn't in the picture. But now that no-risk project is saving us $500,000 a year, reducing our KW by 700, and reducing our KWH by 4 million, and I, those are conservative numbers. And what's the risk? None. And what's, what's the improvement? Better experienced students on campus. If you go see our dorms now and see LED in every dorm room, you're going to say, oh, well, hopefully you're not going to notice because it's, it's just going to say St. John's looks good. But that kind of little improvement with no risk at a quick payback because the technology is there. If we would have put Cogen in, I think I would have got... $1.5 million for LED, and I need to feed the big dog with load. So be careful, size it properly is the point. I'm not saying we're not gonna do cogen in the future. I'm just saying the conservation measures should be done first. <coughs> Capital renewal and replacement should be done with along with that. And I'm just giving you the bottom line here, and, and it says that so many other energy conservation measures at low risk, and I'm just giving you an example. Bill, Kirker and I worked for a company called FRM years ago, and it was generation, distribution, and use, and customer service, right? 
So those were how we structured everything about what we did in that company. And um, I'm just telling you that there's so many other things to do to uh, make the student experience better on campus and keep the doors open for business and then do co -gen. Great. Okay. Uh, so I will also summarize that by saying it's a whole picture. Uh, and uh, as Tom, I think, very clearly said, uh, when, you're th when you're thinking about um, all the other changes that you can make, you have to consider it uh, all as a piece because uh, as those loads drop, and they should drop, I know you're all, you probably all have um, benchmarks that you're, uh, that you're evaluated on at the end of the year. Have you dropped energy? consumption by 5-10%. If you do that year over year, that is going to change the way that you would size a major investment like Cogen. Okay, and turn it over to Jeff. And Jeff, uh, Jeff is, I think, the youngest person on the panel and, and probably has the longest experience with Cogen. So, let's hear. Um, so my name is Jeff Hogan. I'm the Energy and Sustainability Manager for Montsepure Health System or Montsepure Medicine and Academic Health System. They keep on changing the name. Um, Montefiore installed Cogen in 1994. We were building a, a new patient care center uh, and they uh, constructed a basement that could fit a 5.5 megawatt diesel plant. It's, uh, there are Fairbanks Morse engines, they're ship, uh, ship engines, uh, and they're maintained and operated by our engineering staff on site. We have a, a pretty much a pipeline from Maritime College uh, to Montefiore. So we have some pretty knowledgeable operators. Uh, but with that installation uh, being the first in New York City, there were obviously a uh, significant amount of challenges that we had to overcome. We, um, you know, my predecessors, but um, we, we did it because the tariff was changed. The, the utility was required to provide us a backup service. Without that mandate, we likely would not have gone the cogen route. And then the, there's obviously the energy savings aspect of it as well. Uh, but being the, the first mover, um, there were a lot of operational hurdles and a lot of a, a lot of operational challenges. The plan would continue to go down, but you know, as we gained experience and our operators gained experience, uh, as we beefed up our operational staff, um, you know those those uh, issues began to decrease over time. Um, and then we expanded that plant in two thousand and four. Uh, we commissioned a five megawatt solar turbine uh, and we, cho we, we chose to go with the turbine because we realized that the reciprocating, uh, reciprocating engines did not provide a significant uh, amount of steam or steam re uh, heat recovery, uh, which really makes the uh, financial calculations uh, work. So the, with the turbine, we installed the heat recovery steam generator. Uh, that base loaded at 27,000 27, pounds of steam per hour, uh, and with a duct burner, it could get up to 60,000 pounds per hour. Uh, that, in addition to our existing boiler plant, we had ample amounts of steam to uh, satisfy our thermal loads, which are uh, around the clock. Uh, to make, again, make the uh, financial calculations a little bit more attractive to our uh, CFO, we started to switch some of our operations. We switch some pumps from electric to steam. Uh, we actually installed an autoclave on our campus, so we used the steam from our CHP to treat our medical waste. Um, and we also installed a couple of heat exchangers so that we could utilize the steam for uh, domestic hot water. Um, a lot of what has been set up here, I would just echo. So, um, you know, as, as the first mover, we, we did experience a lot of challenges and, and you know, a, a lot of individuals from Montsevier are, you know, throughout New York City right now because of their experience with Cogen. Um, and we're actually in the process right now uh, of investigating uh, the replacement of our plant that was installed in 1993. Uh, and the, re the reason for that is, is because it's becoming uh, not uh, a financially attractive option for us to operate those engines due to the maintenance costs. Um, to that end, I would, I would echo the point of uh, collecting data on your operations. Um, our performance metric is, is cost per kilowatt hour. Uh, so we utilize, we develop our own cost per kilowatt hour individually per plant. We develop our own cost per steam. Uh, and we utilize uh, a benchmark for what we would have paid with the utility. And uh, our, our Fairbanks engines obviously have been installed and operational for 23 years now. 
uh, and they're they're seeing their end of life. They're you know originally marine engines and putting them on land required some modifications. Uh, the load on the engines was you know shearing some crankshafts, and there was you know numerous amounts of, of maintenance that, that we were having to incur, uh, you know, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. Um, and uh, some of that was just because of the location of Fairbanks being in Texas. Every single time we had to fly one of their maintenance mechanics up to Montefiore, the bare minimum cost was ten to $15,000. Then you had to pay for their hotel and all the materials that it came with, whatever we had to do at that point in time. So it was becoming very uh, uneconomical for us to continue that. And we actually shut down the plan and switched that side of the hospital to the utility uh, because we were getting such an attractive utility rate. Electric rates are so low right now. You know, we're actually paying uh, 11 cents per kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour all in. That's our blended rate. Uh, and we were not able to get anywhere near that with our uh, reciprocating engine plant. The, you know, again, the, the steam side, you know, having a significant um, or having heat sinks throughout the campus generating a significant amount of steam, uh, that really makes our uh, performance metrics for the, the solar turbine uh, much more attractive. Uh, this year, we haven't exceeded eight cents per kilowatt hour, uh, which is really where we see our savings. And that's really how we can justify uh, maintaining the plan, showing savings and uh, um, speaking with our financial, you know, folks within the hospital to justify reinvestment into this into this new plan um, that will hopefully hopefully experience the same type of uh, performance metrics and will generate the same cost per kilowatt hour uh, for us moving forward. Um, from a resiliency perspective, <coughs> Montefiore uh, in 2003 when there was a blackout, you know, we maintain operations full capacity. Uh, during Superstorm Sandy and Irene, we were able to maintain operations. Um, we actually were able to take some patients from NYU, I believe it was 27 patients, uh, five from their neonatal intensive care unit. Um, so from a, uh, a resiliency perspective, we obviously see the benefit. Uh, financially, we're also seeing the benefit, but as a hospital, uh, resiliency and redundancy, you know, we have our, our CHP plant, we have uh, a, a significant amount of backup generation diesel generators throughout the campus. Uh, we have our standby uh, accounts through the utility. Uh, we have a main import export account and we we tend to not, again this was iterated before, but um, we, we tend to not export any power because you know if our cost is seven to ten cents per kilowatt hour to produce and they are paying us between two and three cents per kilowatt hour to uh, export, we're, we're losing money. So uh, we tend to not try to export. The utility is, has requested that we maintain our assets to provide the ability to do so, but uh, you know they can't force us to do that uh, and force us to incur financial loss. Um, that being said, for the, the standby accounts, this is just something that hasn't been uh, discussed as of yet. Uh, the standby charges are significant. Uh, we, we were paying, if not using any uh, of the utility service, uh, $50,000 a month just to have that power at the ready. Uh, we had various uh, standby demand charges, standby allocation, uh, KW, for the various. Uh, so those standby charges obviously add up and are included in our cost to generate. Um, there are various programs. Most recently, this past summer, uh, Con Edison came out with a program, their standby uh, demand charge program, whereas if you met a certain um, demand from the from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. from June 15th to September 15th, you were able to get a reduction on your standby uh, demand charges from October until the following year, uh, following October. Uh, so currently, uh, we are experiencing some savings. Uh, it is around twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a month on those standby demand charges, uh, taking into account that our, our Fairbanks plant is shut down. So it, it's a percentage of your total. Uh, demand charge, and uh, you know that that does help the calculation somewhat, uh, but it obviously still is a financial burden. And I know that there are certain organizations throughout New York City that are right now making the case to Con Edison, the PSC, that they're, um, you know, again from being a first mover, I so, would you know iterate what Dan said. You know, have somebody on your your staff that's going to speak for you. A lot of these third party uh, developers 
may or may not have you know ties to certain um, you know, uh, generators. Uh, they may likely uh, <coughs> want to you know steer you in a direction that may or may not be the best fit for your organization. Because again, as it has been said, every cogen plant is going to be his own unique project. Um, so having somebody that's that's not biased is going to be a benefit to you, uh, and having adequate staffing for. Uh, the, the operation of your plant, if that's going to be taken on yourself. Uh, Monsphere, we have boiler operators, we have mechanics, we have um, HVAC managers, HVAC mechanics. The uh, majority of our cooling is, is steam because of our significant uh, steam production from the HERSIG. Uh, and we also have engineering operating supervisors that uh, basically all come from Maritime College, as I mentioned before. Uh, and those individuals are, are well versed with the, the ship. Uh, the ship engines, the the Fairbanks Morse engines specifically. Uh, so operating those and maintaining those engines uh, is, falls on their shoulders, and I do uh, quite a phenomenal job with them when they have uh, uh, the knowledge to do that. Um, so beyond that, uh, I don't I don't want to echo what has been said already so far. Again, so I'll uh, close it up with that. Yeah, it kind of sucks to go last. But yeah. um, one other question. The uh, the question of maintenance has come up at least four times today. Can you give any advice, being a first mover, on how to go in sort of eyes wide open on that? Um, so for our Fairbanks plant, we didn't have a, uh, a maintenance contract. Um, it was just done as needed. Our our new installation, new wear installation, our, our turbine, we do have a maintenance contract that covers basically soup to nuts, anything and everything that may happen. We actually recently had uh, a failure this past August, um, the turbine completely failed. We had to pull it out of the ground, ship it back down to, to solar, and they had to rebuild basically the entire thing, which caused a lot of other problems. Obviously, the entire facility was on um, Con Edison, and we incurred significant electrical charges that we're not necessarily budgeted for. So, um, the maintenance contract that is, you know. Um, Depending upon the, the hours of operation, uh, you know, annually we take ours down, and you know, it's a it's a easily budgeted for uh, cost. Ours is between thirty five, uh, thirty eight thousand. If there's no you know ancillary costs or ancillary charges included within that month, um, but that really really helps. the The turbine seems to be less of a maintenance uh, burden on the organization, reciprocating engines, just because of the the, the vintage of of ours. Obviously, is is a much more significant operational and financial burden. Um, but I, from what I'm seeing and, and reinvestigating new potential technologies, uh, maintenance contracts seems to be something that is discussed frequently by really every um, every engine maker that's that has spoken with us. If I could add to that, um, Con Edison requires um, maintenance contracts for just about every component in your cogeneration system. So, um, the, and the you have to take a look at your cogeneration system to figure out what is the piece of equipment which is going to fail and where you don't have redundancy or where it's going to take a while to uh, to get back up. So in all cogeneration facilities, if you're on natural gas, you have to have a gas compressor. So the gas compressor has to have a, a maintenance agreement or you should have a spare compressor on hand. Your gas turbine or your gas engine or your reciprocating engine needs a, um, a maintenance contract. And in the Conet service territory, if um, you're on primary electric, which or cogen you basically need to be, you have to have a maintenance agreement for your switch gear as well, or demonstrable ability for your staff to maintain the switch gear. So Con Edison, as an example, offers um, classes at their own facility for, for plant operators. Um, NYU, as an example, we sent to all our electricians over a period of six months to their facility to become qualified high voltage electricians and maintenance people. Um, but um, <coughs> absent that, you need to contract it out. So every single piece of component in your cogeneration facility needs to be looked at. You have to work with your utility. They're the ones that are the ones ultimately going to approve your cogeneration system. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to abide by that interconnection agreement. Um, I just signed that agreement about six weeks ago. It's about 50 pages long and it articulates every single piece of equipment you need to maintain and what your obligations are. Questions from the floor. Uh, hope people have questions. All right.
assume for either in Delphi or ecosystems, um, the financial markets have changed, the electric, the gas right now, so the numbers that were presented to you two years ago or whatever, has anybody refreshed them for you? So I'll answer from the ecosystem side. What we guaranteed was the, um, uh, the consumption savings. Uh, we didn't guarantee the commodity costs. So how that works out in reality is. So that's based, then it's based on an energy savings, but not a dollar savings. Yeah, no, we, we can't, you know, unless you're, you're, uh, you're buying fixed price energy five years out. That really isn't in our hands. We're going to. We're going to run the numbers, and we're going to come up with the guaranteed consumption savings, and we'll see if we're off one or two cents per kilowatt hour, which maybe it's changed by. So if it's not 102 months or break even, maybe it's going to be 106 months, uh, but it was still going to be uh, well worth it from a cost-benefit point of view. The other thing to note, actually, is uh, Tim suggested in his numbers, he didn't sort of say out, outright, rather than going for uh, shortest payback, everyone was talking about, you know, what is my CFO demand in terms of uh, payback numbers. Uh, Tim actually is not, uh, did not use all the savings to repay his loan, so he's actually going to be generating a little cash, but he's also going to be providing himself a cushion on exactly Terry's question. What was the life cycle of the project? I think we're figuring at least 25 years, right? Yeah, 20, 25. We're at 25 right now, and we have some major issues. You know, and that might be the thing you'll see. So the takeaway for me on, on energy savings is, you know, yes, it's modeled, it's stipulated, or it's calculated, or whatever. And it's adjusted for occupancy and weather, and this is just generically. But I, I always take away that says, okay, savings comes from equipment and engineering. Excess savings comes from good operations. To me, that's where you, 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 everybody wants the savings, and they're going to guarantee it. But you want the excess savings. And that's going to come from buy-in from your staff and operations and keeping it running and we didn't talk a lot about the connected loads. Connected loads on a cogen plant is a big, giant deal because you've got thermal that is just running through steam or hot water through your campus. You've got to maintain that too so that the engine gets the right temperature back, otherwise it's going to trip out. So the way you get savings, the way you get excess savings, is having everything work to, its, to, to where it's supposed to work, and that's recommissioning, and it's also called a thing called building retuning, which Joanna Moore said. Building retuning is the future. It is the ability to look at trend data from building automation systems and analyze trend data and find out if you're running as efficient as you possibly can. So that's continuous base commissioning, but in the world of you know today's world of language, it's building retuning. So that's fixing what's broken, making it work. Another question? Oh, yeah. Question for post, actually. Um, to hear you say that the distribution system was going to be a huge cost, that doesn't surprise me. When I was at the Housing Authority in New York, very similar thing. Um, steam pipes put in the ground, you know, in the 40s and 50s, uh, and it just wasn't really uh, effective to do that. Um, you mentioned, though, that you have a decent domestic hot water load. I was curious if you had investigated CHP for that comparatively small piece of your operations and what your thoughts were on the suitability of it for your applications. Uh, we, we have a very intermittent domestic hot water load. Uh, it's when showers are going in the evening in the dormitories, we have a high load. When uh, athletics are at full swing, uh, we have a high load. However, it drops off dramatically um, very frequently. Uh, so we, we don't have a, that was one of our biggest problems is having that, not having a, enough load on the thermal side. Um, and what really made the uh, return on investment 
not look good for going to a coach-in situation. Okay. Okay. All right. So thank you very much to the panelists.